Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jessica Devereaux coming to you from our Baltimore studio. We just finished screening the documentary Body of War and now we're here to talk about the film and we have the co-director here joining us, Phil Donahue. So I'm going to open up the floor for questions from the audience. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand and you know we can get Phil to answer it. All right. Will you please uh, stand up? Stand up? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, Mr. Donahue, I had the privilege of seeing your film when it first came out. And you were kind enough to provide the members of the audience with this shirt, oh. which, <laughs> which has on it the names of the 20 th 26, right? 26. The Immortal 20 23. 23, the Immortal 23. Based on what you've seen happen in Washington since that time, I wonder if you'd be kind enough to share with us your perspectives on this question. Uh, who in Washington on Capitol Hill would you call an immortal today? Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you give me way too much power. <laughs> um, I like Bernie Sanders. Um, I think um, I, I'm hesitant. To, people ask me who I'm going to vote for. I, you know, I, my, I'm troubled because Bernie Sanders is 72 years old. And I'm afraid we have across our heartland a feeling that you don't vote for a candidate unless he or she proves they will be tough. Mm -hmm. Dissent is very difficult now in this, in our, this moment in our nation's history. I'm sure it always was, but I don't think it's ever been tougher than it is now. Um, we celebrate, we seem to have become a warrior nation. We spend two billion dollars a day on things that go boom. And we're losing wars. We're like a wounded king. Uh, we somehow feel, and we're sending the most cowardly instrument in the history of warfare, drones, and we're killing children and wedding parties. We bombed Grenada. Uh, you know, it, it, we got 23 no votes in 19, in 2002. It would be interesting to know how many we got today. Mm -hmm. It'd be more. There'd be more senators voting no. But the fascinating question is whether they would be in the majority. That's the best I can do to your answer. I mean, someday I'll be smart enough to predict these things, but not today. OK. <coughs> Any other questions? <coughs> yes. I just, was, I just was wondering about this resolution. Um, is this something that, uh, what happened in 2002, is that like an eternal thing that it can never be reversed? I mean, is that power given to every president this well, time for it? Or? It certainly shouldn't be. First of all, it was an unconstitutional action on the part of the both houses of Congress. This was not uh, uh, adherent to Article One, Section 8. This was not Congress voting up or down on, on war. This was Congress saying, here, Mr. President, if you have to, here's permission. And then if the President goes and it doesn't work, all those who voted for it are able to say, well, he said, I thought he didn't tell, I, we. Yeah, so it's a cover your ass uh, maneuver that spineless Congresses have executed on matters of war now since the early 40s. Congress has not declared war, as you know, 
since before World War II, uh, or during World War II. This is shameful. They don't want the job. They see it as a third rail and it's too politically risky. It could be politically fatal. So they finesse it. Mm. So how do you get them to reclaim that job then, Phil? Well, the first thing we, we want to do is, you know, stop the pretense. We can't, we can't say how proud we are to be Americans and stand mute as the Bill of Rights is being dismantled. We, we are a nation of law unless we're scared. And we are certainly scared now. We are sleeping with one eye open. Nobody likes us. We're spent two billion dollars a day. We are building aircraft carriers and 19 guys with box cutters brought this nation to its knees. Two guys with pressure cookers closed the city of Boston. So we want to elect uh, uh, political leaders who will reach out rather than lash out. We must stop marginalizing progressive voices. We must celebrate dissent. If we can't dissent, especially at a time of war, then stop sending all these young men and women to war to defend this way of life, at the center of which is the right of free speech and dissent. The framers were right. The, the, the progressives are the patriots. We don't think you should be listening in on phone calls without judicial authorization. We don't think you should have a man in a cage for 14 years with no phone calls, Red Cross, phone, letters from home, nothing. And the American people are allowing this to happen. So, you know, we need a total, there are millions of Americans who believe that to dissent when a president is calling a war is unpatriotic. And it's killing our young adult children. And I think, I think creating a circumstance where our our children will wonder if they got on the wrong bus or entered the wrong marathon. We're going to have to get naked to get on an airplane. The president's going to have to go into a, uh, in a Bradley armored vehicle to visit a church picnic. This is not making us stay safe. We have to stop it. And it's just a very difficult sell. It's a very difficult. We, <laughs> We don't know what we're talking about. We're, we're patronized. We're, everything conspires to war. Everything. You know? Any other questions? Yes? <coughs> uh, what parallels are there between the events depicted in this film and the, the recent vote on the... Um, the authorization to uh, attack the ISIL forces in Syria and Iraq? Well, I think they're both uh, executed without a lot of thought. You know, uh, moderate, what are we talking, mo moderate Muslims? Syrian uh, rebels. Say, yeah. What? Moderate Syrian rebels. Moderate Syrian rebels. It says moderate, I guess, on their T-shirts, right? <laughs> uh, I would encourage the members of our panel to get in on this because, uh, really, they have so much. Here are the, we're looking at moral courage right here. Yeah, I think if that's okay, we can pause the Q&A right now and um, we can move into the panel. But before I do that, I want to introduce our senior editor and CEO of The Real News Network, Paul J. Paul. Hi. Uh, I've been asked to make some uh, welcoming remarks. Uh, welcome. Uh, who am I standing in front of? Just 
Uh, I, I just want to add one thing to what's going to be said tonight. Uh, from the bombing of Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the Cold War, uh, it became okay to violate any law, uh, any article of the Constitution, to defend what was supposed to be Americanism. Uh, but we know America is not, we're all in the same boat kind of society. Uh, this is a society where some people, uh, very few people own most of things and most people don't own much. And Americanism is different to depending on, on where you're at on that scale. But the, uh, the ability to use police forces, the intelligence forces to, in the name of defending Americanism, suppress dissent, uh, and it's a very important thing for Baltimore uh, because, uh, as you can see in the audience tonight, uh, not a lot of black Baltimore is here. In fact, very few. Because uh, I don't think we as journalists and we in the media have made the connection for people here how this surveillance state, this police state, affects ordinary people's lives. Um, there's a man in the audience here who I hope is going to get a chance to speak later, uh, Eddie Conway, who uh, spent 44 years in jail uh, convicted for a crime he didn't commit, set up by a program called COINTELPRO, mm. uh, which was a FBI, NSA, CIA, all the local police forces, uh, using infiltration tactics, poison pen letters, uh, setting people up for murders they didn't commit, trying to get people to commit murders, uh, sometimes successfully. Um, and he has a great line in his book where he says, uh, COINTELPRO continues today. They just codified it as the Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. um, the, the importance for people in Baltimore that, and, and in cities like Baltimore all around the country uh, is that, like we were talking the other day, is why isn't there uh, more of a political movement in Baltimore? Why aren't people suffering so much, fighting back on a bigger scale? Why are the neighborhoods so broken up? Well, it's not through, uh, through nothing. It's through conscious effort. And one of the conscious effort was to destroy the leadership that came up in the 1960s. So that the community, this next generation that came next, they had no very few uh, elders, rebellious elders, experienced elders to pass on the baton to them. And so you have a situation now where, uh, you know, in a sense, most of the community is, is kind of depoliticized in a way. Um, so at the Real News, and one of the, one of the reasons we're in Baltimore, is the, the, the courage on the stage uh, behind me and what the, the, the whistleblowers and the journalists who will be speaking, that message isn't penetrating ordinary people. It's not getting to the mass consciousness. Now, it's partly because the media doesn't let them on, that's, but that's only part of the problem. There's another issue, which is, is and this is what we're going to try to help solve. Um, as, as, as media, we have to connect these issues to people's day-to-day -day problems, day-to-day -day suffering. Uh, you know, why is there a murder epidemic? Why is there such unemployment? Why are the schools in such rotten shape? It's all one thing. This, uh, the surveillance state, the police state, why do they need this kind of state? Because they're terrified that people will wake up in cities like Baltimore and say, we've had enough. So it's all one thing, but right now ordinary people don't see it that way. So we're going to, as the real news, this is a taste of what we're going to do, and we're going to try, hopefully in six months, this place will be packed with ordinary people from Baltimore who do see these issues connect to solutions, because in the final analysis, the solution is we're not afraid, not to be afraid of this state. We just need to be aware it's doing it, but on the, on the you, know, you know, the Shah of Iran had a hell of a police state. So did Mubarak, so did Marcos in the Philippines, and there's been a hell of police states. But when tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are ready, there's not much that police, that police state actually starts to crack. So letting people know what we're doing is critical, piece of the process, letting know, I mean, what the police state's doing. But we don't need to be afraid of it. What we need to do is make sure that when, when when crisis hits, and it's going to hit in terms of economic crisis, climate change crisis, we have to be ready so that people have uh, a way to uh, work with each other, to find the most advanced experience in terms of how to fight. And, uh, and then I think we're going to see this police state, this uh, surveillance state, you know, they'll be listening. 
but people aren't going to be afraid to be talking because we're going to talk, you know, with tens of thousands of people, and then let them listen. But uh, in the meantime, it's people that are brave that are waking lots of people up. So I turn it over to them. <laughs> okay, so. Paul, thank you for that introduction. And I can now introduce this esteemed panel that you see before me. Um, this is kind of like the all-star team of whistleblowers <laughs> when it comes to the surveillance state. So to my far right is Thomas Drake. He is a former senior executive at the National Security Agency, where he blew the whistle on massive multi-billion dollar fraud, waste, and the widespread violations of the rights of citizens through secret mass surveillance programs after 9-11. As retaliation, the Obama administration indicted Drake in 2010 as the first whistleblower since Daniel Ellsberg charged with espionage. And Drake faced 35 years in prison, turning him into an enemy of the state for his oath to defend the Constitution. In 2011, the government's case against him collapsed and he went free in a plea deal. He is the recipient of many <coughs> awards and we thank you so much for joining us, Thomas. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> And to my right is Bill Benny. Bill is a former high-level National Security Agency intelligence official who after 2001 um, retirement, after 30 years, blew the whistle on the NSA surveillance programs. His outspoken criticism of the NSA during the George W. Bush administration made him the subject of FBI investigations that included a raid on his home in 2007. Did they get anything good, Bill? No. Okay, okay. <laughs> Even before Edward... They couldn't understand it. <laughs> Even before Edward Snowden's NSA whistleblowing, Binney publicly, publicly revealed that NSA had access to telecommunications companies' domestic and international billing records, and that since 9-11, the agency has intercepted some 15 to 20 trillion communications. Thank you so much for joining us, Bill. And to my left, um, they're kind of partners in whistleblowing <laughs> is, is Kirk Weeby. Kirk has been on The Real News many times. Uh, here. here we go. Kirk is a retired National Security Agency wh whistleblower as well, who worked at the agency for 36 years. You, K Kirk, you, you, you and Bill developed the thin thread information processing system that arguably could have detected and prevented the 9-11 terrorist attacks. NSA officials, though, ignored the program in favor of Trailblazer, another program <coughs> that ended in total failure with costs of billions of dollars. Weeby and Binney blew the whistle internally on Trailblazer, but to no avail. Post 9-11, the NSA used thin thread to illegally spy on U.S. citizens' communications, unable to stay at NSA any longer in good conscience. Weeby retired in October of 2001. Since retiring, Kirk and Bill made several key public disclosures regarding NSA's massive surveillance program. Thank you so much mm. for your courage, and thank, thank you for you. being here, Kirk. <laughs> and uh, to Kirk's left is Marsha Coleman at Abayu. She, as a senior policy analyst for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, became a whistleblower when the EPA ignored her complaints about a U.S. company harming the environment and human health in its vanadium mining in South Africa. Denied promotion, she sued and won a jury verdict finding EPA guilty of discrimination. Coleman Adebayo is a founder of the No Fear Coalition and EPA Employees Against Racism. Under her leadership, No Fear organized a grassroots campaign that won passage of the Notification of Federal Employees Anti-Discrimination and Retaliation Act. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Coleman out of Bayou serves on the board of directors of the National Whistleblower Center and was inducted into the Project on Government Oversight's Hall of Fame. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Thank you. Sure. And of course, you recognize this face, Phil Donahue. Um, for those that weren't tuned in earlier, Phil is the co-director of the documentary that we just screened, Body of War. But he really changed the face of daytime television, pioneering the <coughs> audience participation talk format as the host of The Donahue Show, a 29-year run which stands as the longest of its kind in U.S. television history. Thank you so much for being with us, Phil, as well. Pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. 
So where do we begin? Um, it, it seems like from our Q&A, we, we can discuss current events and possibly be able to unpack some of these issues that we, we came across in the film and relate it back to what's happening now to back to what happened back then in 2002 and then leading up to the invasion in 2003. So our one member of the audience asked about ISIS and now this, this, this fear mongering that's really going on in Cap on Capitol Hill, which is, I cover Capitol Hill for the real news, and I've seen it firsthand. Um, people are talking about um, immigrants being able to cross the border, and you know now we could have ISIS in our in our backyards. You know all this type of fear mongering that's going on, but relating it back to this idea of of the surveillance state. Um, let's. I I guess does anyone want to actually first maybe just comment, make some comments about what what that our audience member asked us about ISIS and, and this new threat, and how are you perceiving this? Does anyone want to start? Well, I could, uh, I could say a few words about that. I, okay. I've uh, been on some radio shows and made some comments about that too. Uh, w what we're doing is, uh, this is like the third time we're going back there to do this again. Uh, what we're doing is getting involved in a religious war that's been going on for several millennia. I mean, we can't solve this. Those people there have to solve it. We can't solve it for them. So coming, going back in is just going to say, well, we are solve it for a few years, and we'll have to come back in again. I mean, we're not going to resolve this for them. It's their issue. They have to stand up and resolve it for themselves. And, and do you mean joint Arab states, coalition, something like that? It's the people at the area, all of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Saudis, the Jordanians, Iranians, they all have to work to fix that problem themselves. They're the, they're the problem. It's coming from them. It's coming from the Wahhabi effort. It's coming from the Iranians. Uh, they're, it's a religious issue. The Shia and the Sunni and the, and the Kurds, that's a religious issue. Mm. That's been going on for millennia. Mm. Well, I, I, I think that there's, you know, for, for me, I suppose, the question is really one of, of how this economy is structured. Um, because if it wasn't ISIS, it would be something else. I think most of us in this room understand that. Um, that when you have an economy which is built on militarism and the purchase of military items, and you have, you know, curricula in school which deals, you know, which glorifies war and everything war, um, you know, you have a society which perpetuates these kinds of, of these kinds of uh, these goals and these frameworks. So I think we're clear about that. Whether you're talking about militarism in, um, you know, in Michigan, or you're talking about militarism in, mid in the Middle East, you have a, a whole society that's basically predicated upon war. And the question is, you know, how do we as progressives come together and begin? I think you're right to educate people that there are alternatives to economies being built upon war. You know, how do we have an economy which values human life over war? How do we begin to, to, to value econ For example, when do we begin to tell the truth about the fact that a lot of what's happening in the Middle East is really of America's making? <coughs> you know, when we decide that we're going to, you know, uh, commit coup d'etats in Libya or coup d'etats in other parts of the country, and then we faint surprise you know, when, when these economies in these countries begin to, to blow up. Um, I think there's something just fundamentally dishonest, academically dishonest about that. Um, so I just, you know, I just wanted to put that out there because I think we need to have a discussion about the structural nature of this economy. In fact, I was on the Hill a couple of days ago and we sort of passed by some, you know, armament companies, you know, again selling their war machines to members of Congress. And of course, one of the things we found out in a recent hearing is that the Pentagon, of course, lied to us again. They told us that the armament that we saw in Ferguson and other parts of this country uh, were basically leftover um, you know, tanks and guns from our war ventures. When we found out during a congressional hearing, in fact, is that 40% of the arms that are being given to police departments in this country are actually new equipment, which means that the military industrial companies have now found um, new markets 
for their equipment, which are quite frankly our local police stations and our, local, our, our, our regional um, police departments. So I think first of all, we've got to start off with the truth. Mm. And then we have to really get to the economics issues in terms of you know, how capitalism fuels these kinds of wars of, 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 uh, of, of imperialism and, and, and how we're going to, as a progressive community, begin to stop this. Yeah. Injecting some truth is, is something, obviously, here at The Real News, we're trying to bring into this discussion and context. Um, I can speak personally about something that happened um, to my friend James Foley, the journalist mm -hmm. who was beheaded in, in Syria. And, um, you know, I, you, dealing with that emotional, uh, it was very emotional for me when I found out, but when I, when I spoke to Paul, Paul J, about how I should cover it, you know, I, I wanted to do a tribute, but I also wanted to provide some context, because I think a lot of Americans were watching that and, and you know, just being, having this, this, this sort of reaction that we have to be aggressive and we have to show military might or whatever the case may be, but they're not understanding the history as well. So I, I, I wrote this whole tribute talking about the invasion in mm -hmm. Iraq, and we have to remember mm -hmm. why we were there in the first, first place, place. Why we, what, what we're breeding, how we're, we're arming mil extremists, how we're arming the very same people that we've done in Afghanistan, you know, you know, arming the Taliban, and now we're fighting them, and we just keep on perpetuating this, mm -hmm. and um, trying to bring some sort of truth into the discussion and right. some um, light, you right. know, shedding some light, and that's what, that's what I tried to do in that piece, but yeah, absolutely. I think that's necessary. I'm reminded of George Orwell, that truth is the first casualty of war. Mm. Um, and propaganda pretense uh, become excuses and justifications. I just want to share seeing, seeing the body of war and reflecting back on my years as a senior executive at the National Security Agency brings to light a couple of things I'd like to share with you all. Uh, I remember in the months leading up to the uh, preemptive invasion of Iraq, that whole pretense. I knew an Arab, uh, Arabic linguist. Uh, I used to be a linguist myself, a crypto linguist, uh, during the Cold War. And in fact, my roommate at the Defense Language Institute uh, was an Arab linguist. This particular uh, Arab linguist is considered one of the best at NSA. And he was actually on the briefing team the briefing team at NSA that was supporting a, a series of briefings that were being given uh, to Colin Powell. This is before his infamous um, pronouncements uh, before the United Nations, in which he brought forward all that evidence as proof, probable cause evidence, as justification for the, for the invasion. He was... Um, sitting outside the main briefing room. They were available and on call to provide clarification in terms of the intelligence. And he said there was no intelligence. And he remembers during the time in which Powell, in this one particular briefing, was being given the quote-unquote slam dunk evidence by George Tenet, who at the time was the director of the CIA. And he was sitting there thinking, I know that everything that Tenet is telling Powell is a complete lie. And yet he told me, I'll always regret knowing that was a complete lie, that I never actually went into the room and said so. I kept my mouth shut. I remained silent. And he says, I will live with that for the rest of my life. And you can tell he's extraordinarily burdened by that. What he could have said, and he was a lead Arab linguist. The other anecdote I will wish to relate, this is when I was teaching at the National Defense University as a visiting professor of behavioral science, strategic leadership, leadership ethics, um, information strategies. And, um, as an industrial ecology of the armed forces, I was actually NSA chair there. And I remember a lieutenant colonel in one of my seminars, 2006, 
we got to talking about Iraq, and of course, this was the period of 2006 and 2007 in which the infamous surge was going to save the day for us. And he said he was given a specific task shortly after the, in, the preemptive invasion that his unit, and he was the, the deputy, basically the deputy battalion commander, his specific mission was to find weapons of mass destruction. They, hadn't, they had, had all the so-called evidence, right, as the excuse, but they didn't actually have real evidence. So it was left up to his unit to scour the countryside looking for any proof that the weapons of mass destruction actually existed. And he said it became quickly, uh, clear very quickly as they were going to and fro across what was mostly desert, military posts, other facilities, we're talking like the entire country. And other than coming across stuff that was leftovers from the time in which he was developing and had developed <coughs> some mass destruction, they didn't find any evidence. And this was months on and months on. And every time they get up in the morning, sending the troops out, your task is to find the evidence. Your task is to find those weapons. They never did run across any weapons. He said after about five or six months in this fruitless <coughs> campaign behind the scenes to find all these so-called weapons of mass destruction, he really began to question why had we even invaded the place in the first place? What was this really all about? And that started a whole conversation in the seminar about why the United States had chosen to preemptively invade Iraq, which had nothing to do, in spite of all the pronouncements <coughs> of Vice President Cheney, had nothing to do with 9-11. And yet there we were, with all those troops, and all that treasure, and all that blood, and never mind all the casualties that were incurred by the country of Iraq. And I'm extraordinarily sobered right now because after seeing the body of war, history is just screaming in my ear. And here we are. What is this, version 2.0, 3.0? We're gonna go in and somehow redo it? It's a do-over? We get our chance? Because now apparently ISIS, ISIL, is, I guess it depends on what is, is. This, <laughs> This is the biggest threat that ever, we've ever faced from the Middle East, that this is actually worse than Al-Qaeda? I, I shudder. I really do. And I fear for the Republic. Okay. Phil, do you, do you have anything to add to that after hearing? Well, I don't think, I don't see how you could, could not feel this way. I mean, the, the, the whole notion of this fabulous idea embodied in the Constitution is turning to dust. And uh, I see no, uh, I see no uh, urgency uh, among the populace. Now, in many ways, I think we're popular. I think we are. I think the majority of the people agree with us. I like to be popular. Okay. Uh, and we're going <laughs> yeah, to okay. have to get used to this. Yeah, yeah. But they're not heard. And it's not only that they're not covered. That's mm -hmm. certainly true. Uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of closeted dissenters. There is a very... There's a, it's, it's hard to speak out, especially if you've got a Republican boss. Democrat. I can or, give you, or Democrat. Or Democrat. Yeah, yeah. that's true. Uh, yeah. I can give you a very pragmatic side to why people don't. From 
in respect of my own, my own ordeal facing many, many decades in prison, because all I did was take an oath to support and defend the Constitution. Any number of people I used to work with, those who knew me or knew of me, were quite sympathetic to what I did. And yet they said, I have a job, I have a mortgage, I have retirement, I have kids in college. And so on Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, obviously self-actualization under that grand experiment of the Constitution for all its faults and foibles really takes a back seat because their own security takes primacy. Mm -hmm. And even if, even if the security is false, or as General Michael V. Hayden said as a mantra, we just need to make Americans feel safe again. That's not an oath that I took to support and defend. Make Americans feel safe. But that brought home for me, and in conversations I had with Ellsberg, Daniel Ellsberg, he was the first American, first whistleblower charged under the same Espionage Act that I was charged with 40 years later. He thought a lot more people that knew the bright and shining lie of Vietnam would step forward. And other than a few close associates, they didn't. They chose to continue to go about their daily lives. He actually, people don't fully appreciate that Ellsberg himself, like I and Bill and Kirk and Diane Rourke and Ed Loomis, all went through channels within the government. Ellsberg spent several years winding his way through the corridors of power in Congress fell on completely on deaf ears. No one wanted to touch it. <clears throat> and it was just ironic for me because the day I was scheduled to go to public trial was the 40th anniversary of the very day in which the Pentagon Papers was published. The presses started rolling. And he said that much, in fact, he said what was illegal during the Nixon administration is now legal under the Bush and the Obama administration. Um, does it matter? I mean, we have to face the reality that it is we the people, and ultimately we get the government, we get. And I keep asking the fundamental question. Because see, we're canaries, those of us that are whistleblowers and truth tellers, We've stood up at great price, some f worse than others. Um, one period that Ellsberg doesn't talk about is the two years of the trial. He said it's still too painful after all these, all these decades. We're the canaries in the coal mine, and it's ultimately about we the people. Um, I keep asking the question, what country, what future do you want to keep? It is the fatal flaw of all forms of democracy, is in the end, you know, Lord Acton is probably right. You know, the power does tend to corrupt, and absolute power certainly corrupts absolutely. And here you have an extraordinary um, concentration of power. And we were eyewitness. Kirk, I would mean, speak directly for all three of us. You can imagine finding out right after 9-11. And I had found out independently of the two of them. Um, that in the deepest of secrecy, which is still a secret, by the way, I mean, this is more secret than even the torture program, um, that the government unchained itself from the Constitution. The, the Fourth Amendment didn't mean anything. That the commander-in-chief was the, that those powers, quote-unquote, given to the president in, in Article I were, were the only powers necessary. Remember, we need to make Americans feel safe again. Bush stands on that rubble pile of 9-11. Mm. 
So then he t exhorts Americans to go to the shopping malls as if nothing has changed. Okay. See, we're burdened, the three of us. We're burdened in an extraordinary way that I cannot possibly capture in words. That 9-11 was completely preventable. Kirk, can you actually explain that for us? How was it prevented? <coughs> well, I, I have a couple of emotions that I am harboring uh, in listening to these wonderful vignettes and stories and beliefs that my uh, co-panelists have. Um, let me comment first, if I may, mm -hmm. on the issue of what are we to do? Mm -hmm. And I think Phil touched upon that. It, it's, it's frustrating to beat your head uh, against the walls of the Hill of Congress. We, and Bill and I and Tom, we've all been up there talking to various people across the political spectrum. And they listen, they smile, and uh, say, we'll see you, and, and, and encourage you a bit. But literally nothing happens. Uh, we had great hopes for Senator uh, Wyden, who was one of the most outspoken on the uh, surveillance state issue. Uh, but really, He's not uh, managed to break through in any large measure with any legislation. Uh, Leahy now offers legislation in the Freedom Act that essentially does nothing to change. Um, it's as if Capitol Hill is trying to do the least it can to appease the American people. So we're not being well served. So well, you might say, but isn't this illegal? under the Constitution? Well, sure it is. This is the 14th year of illegality since 9-11. Uh, and we still have yet to go to the Supreme Court. So how long can we wait before something is done? I think it will reach the Supreme Court. There's a couple of cases that Bill and I and Tom have signed affidavits about and are trying to help, but it's painfully slow. It's ridiculously slow. So we, we have a huge government that seems incapable of doing anything about it. And I agree with Tom, it comes down to you and me. Unfortunately, when you look across society, we've corrupted ourselves ethically and morally. And what I mean by that is this. There's a institute, and I urge you to go out and look at its documentation and database called the Josephson Institute. It only looks at one thing in American society. That's honesty and cheating. If you look at the statistical data from the 1940s, when about 20% of our youth in high school and colleges readily admitted cheating to get ahead, that number now is in excess of 90 percent. And it has been for the last 20 to 30 years. Now what happens to 20-year-olds? They grow up and become 40-year-olds and 50-year-olds, and they occupy positions of responsibility in companies, on our campuses, they're teachers, they're throughout society. Cheating on campus is so bad, the universities don't even try to deal with it anymore. The best the professors can do is change the exam periodically and hope no one steals it or gets it or cribs it or shares it via Facebook or texting on the iPhone. Um, we have a heck of a problem here. If there's so much tolerance for wrongdoing, is there any question why the majority of people don't rally quickly uh, to, to face this issue? We've got to get back to some ethics. We don't even teach it. And if you ask somebody, what's your ethic? Well, it all depends, doesn't it? And we have 50,000 definitions of what's ethical. But if we as a society are going to together progress, we've got to have some ethics. And we've got to understand. And I love Phil's um, uh, reference to the Founding Fathers, especially the First Amendment. I think all those amendments are important because without them, we're toast. The government can do whatever it wants to, and as far as I'm concerned, what it is that's what's happening. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I'm really worried. I really am. Mm. You're we're not under rule of law, then what are we under? The rule of ourselves. Yeah. 
Yeah. Marsha? No, I actually didn't hear what he said. What did you just I mean, fundamentally, I mean, this is the thing. I grew up in the 1970s. Right. I mean, this is just for me, it's, I never imagined that I'd be even on stage here. I just never, I have been for the past several years. I'm extraordinarily fortunate when you're faced with having all your freedoms taken away and st staring prison in the face uh, against an implacable foe who wants to put you away for a long, long time. You really come to appreciate what freedom and liberty mean. Right. You know, I wake up every morning pinching myself. I know there's people in far worse straits than I was. But the government clearly wanted to make an example of me. It's one reason Bill began because he you know, he saw what was happening to me, and you reckon realize what what the truth was. And you know, I I <coughs> salute Bill and and Kirk and Diane and Ed. Have, and, and Ed just uh, Ed Lewis just wrote a book about this, about his experience at NSA. Uh, is it worth it? I mean, I, you know, this is I keep I, I have to keep coming back to the fundamentals. Is it worth it? I think it is worth it. I would. People ask me, Tom, why are you doing all this? Why don't you just live the rest of your life? You still got about most most of half your life left. Why don't you just go out and enjoy it? You paid a high enough price. I said, wait a minute. It's not about me. It's about who we are as people. It's who we are together. It's what kind of world we want to create. Uh, I, I, I can't sit by, idly by, just watching all this, uh, you know, the very country that I took an oath to support and defend disappear. Um, I can't. And we have to get back to that fundamental question because, you know, I talk, we, even ourselves, we're in front of a lot of audiences. Um, the last couple, three years, in front of a lot of uh, universities and colleges. <coughs> and it clearly resonates. But we have an extraordinary concentration of power in this country. And it is the 1%. It's the largest redistribution of wealth this country has ever seen in its history. And you know, that kind of power. I'm, I have to say this. I mean, this is where truth is crystal clear here. But it's truth that's very uncomfortable. Mm. That kind of power does not yield willingly. Mm. It just doesn't. And so if you're an Obama, for example, for all the hope and change, and, every, and I know many, many young people that I work with. I work mostly <laughs> each and every day okay, um, with 20 and 30, early 30-somethings. They are completely turned off by politics. They said, we, we are so, feel so betrayed by what has happened in the last six years. But if you're a president and you become, you know, you're Obama, you become president and you go into that Oval Office and you find out that there's this silver platter and it's got all these secrets and surveillance and all these special things and privileges, and it's like, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna give those up. Mm. I'm gonna hold on to them. And I might even find a way to create a legal framework to institutionalize those. Just listen to Obama's response to, uh, to John Stewart on The Daily Show. But the last time I checked, the President of the United States, there's no legal framework that he creates. He's bound by the Constitution. So what happens when not just the executive branch is unchained, but the President him or herself feels that they can wrap themselves in the robes of their own moral rectitude that somehow they know best for us. They're not bound by the rule of law. They're not bound by the Constitution. Then that's putting an executive in a place where it's simply governance by secret rule, mm -hmm. by executive rule. And I will tell you from history, having come back from Germany fairly recently, having given, Bill and I gave direct <laughs> testimony to the Bundestag inquiry, I was at the Stasi headquarters looking deep into the abyss of a former police state, seeing rows and rows and rows of all those paper-based files of people and their lives and labels put on index cards that you're a threat to the state, staring into that abyss. Last time I checked, you know, that's a form of, go of governance that uh, is actually violates the oath that I took to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I never imagined <coughs> that my own government would become <coughs> the very threat to the Constitution. And that's precisely what we face. 
They don't yield willingly. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, is it getting worse, Marsha? I mean, we've discussed this. Well, you know, I guess there are a couple of things I wanted to say. One was, um, is that we actually, within the federal government, we actually put up a major struggle inside the federal government. And I just think it's important for people to understand that, at least with the work that I did inside the federal government. Um, it was called the No Fear Coalition, the No Fear Struggle. And it was thousands of federal employees um, after I won my lawsuit and only three percent of us ever see the inside of a courtroom because as you can imagine it's very expensive to go to court it's very difficult to um, to fight um, the federal government when every single day you're basically being hit over the head you know with with, with a coke bottle and in my case so I'm a, I was also the victim of death threats rape threats um, my daughter was, as you know, almost kidnapped in South Africa when I went to investigate the, 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 the murder of these people in South Africa. So it's very difficult to, to fight the United States government. Just take that as a given. Um, and, and, and so what I found out working at EPA, and I was in the diplomatic office at EPA, and so I was the, I was the EPA liaison to the White House when Nelson Mandela became president. And it was my job to go to South Africa and to work with the new South Africa government and to help them create an environmental department that was going to be useful to the, to the people of South Africa. And in this context, I found out about a U.S. corporation that was murdering um, this mining community, reported it back to the White House, and was given a direct order to shut up. Um, and when I told them that I refused to shut up, um, then the gloves went off, came off. And so that's when the phone calls started and people parking in front of my home and my kids, I had to send my kids away. And so it was, it was a very, very difficult, very difficult time. Um, and so I live with the fact that, and they would call me and say, there's gonna be a bomb under your car, so don't be surprised when you get in your car and you get a big bang when you put your foot on the accelerator. So, so most of us have lived with the U.S. government seeing us as enemies of the state. And so my tact inside the EPA was to organize um, because that's the tradition, the black tradition that I come out of mm -hmm. is organizing the community. And so one day I just got on my computer and I said, would anyone like to meet me in this room at this time to talk about harassment and, re and retaliation and discrimination at the EPA? And when I got to the room on that particular day, there were so many people in the hallways. I literally had to fight through the hallways to get to the room. And I realized, you know what? There's an issue here, and we're going to organize. And so we decided, a very small group of us, actually the number was 12, which is interesting, we decided that none of us were going to survive. Our, we, were, we were all going to get fired. We knew that. Mm -hmm. But we decided that before we left the EPA, they were going to know that we were there and that our kids were going to know we were there. And so we started organizing. And, and, and then we decided, uh, once I testified, after I won my case and I testified before Congress, the EPA was too small, that we had organized throughout the entire federal government. And that's when we started the No Fear Coalition. And we decided we needed legislation to address the retaliation, the brutality of speaking out within the federal government. It took us two years. And I must tell you, I went to more funerals than I want to admit to. Because people were having heart attacks and strokes and you had managers literally sitting on people's necks when they come into the office. And a lot of people just didn't have the stamina to, withhold, to, to withstand that kind of harassment. And so we had casualties. I don't want you to think that this is without casualties. But, 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 but we were able to get the legislation um, introduced. And actually, we were on the steps of the Capitol when the plane flew over. And it was interesting because we looked at each other and we said, you know what, I'm sure a whistleblower tried to warn the government. Wow. And as we <laughs> sort of ran for our lives, because the order came out, run for your life, and everybody started running down the street. And we all assumed we were going to be vaporized that day. Um, but, we, but we stayed with it. We stayed with it. And we were able to pass the first civil rights and whistleblower law of the 21st century called No Fear. And it's interesting, we've had a lot of trouble outside of your network really getting the story out mm -hmm. about the importance of organizing 
um, because one of the reasons why I do come out and talk to people is because I believe in organizing. You know, I believe in organizing, and I believe if we organize, we can, in fact, change the government. And I don't mean just changing people from one seat to another seat. We can change the economic structure that promotes militarism and, dehuman and dehumanizing people. And we can, we, can, we can have a different future for ourselves and for our children. But I think it's important for us to talk about organizing. And when we start to go down the road of what can I do, I think the issue is we can organize. We can pick up the phone, we can call our colleagues, we can make phone calls to this organization and that organization, and we can say, let's come together, let's put up a fight. And that's what we did in, in, you know, in, our, in, our, in our struggle. We put up a fight, and we won. We had a taste of victory. And now we're going back now for No Fear Two, which will actually make it a crime to discriminate and retaliate against people uh, attached to actually um, uh, sentencing if you, in fact, are found in, to engage in this kind of activity. And we are actually receiving support both from, from both Republicans and the Democrats because we found out that the U.S. government has spent over a billion dollars protecting discriminators and retaliators in the federal government, a billion dollars. So, so I think, you know, my, my contribution to this is that we must, as Stokely Carmichael said, mm -hmm. we must organize, organize, organize. And we've got to organize at every single level of society, from the grassroots to the professional societies. And we have to stay together. And we have to really know that, in fact, we can win this, but we can't lose heart in the process. Yeah. We have to stay strong. But we can, we can win this. Bill, you. you wanted to jump in? Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, Marcia, you're a rock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And uh, the publisher will Thank you. be happier if you show that a lot. I, I, can, I want to take advantage of my presence on the stage with mm -hmm. former NSA personnel here. Uh, and also keep me from falling through a trap door. Of, I want to be able to prove what I say. So are there 16 federal intelligence agencies uh, what is the round number of employees in those intelligence mm -hmm. agencies? Is it true that most of the intelligence work is farmed out to private companies? And I had one more. How many Americans have top security clearance? Mm -hmm. All right, so those four questions. Who wants to feel uh, Well, I, I think I think it guess between 1.5 and 2 million have top secret clearances. Okay. Um, uh, there's more that have secret. Uh, uh, the number that's the is that's the highest form of top secret. No. Uh, top secret is the highest classification level, but, but there are compartments after that. For example, spying on everybody in the United States was a program called Stellar Wind that was compartmented, and maybe only um, uh, initially maybe only several hundred people were cleared for it in the government. And uh, now I think that's more like 12, 15,000 are cleared for it. Right. That's all of your emails and phone calls that are recorded and everything. It's so not just metadata. It's content and everything. And it's done primarily with a program called Fairview that has about uh, 80 to 100 taps on the fiber optic network inside the lower 48 states of the United States. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're copying us really heavy, and that's where the FBI and the DEA are using all this data mm -hmm. to go look for criminal activity. Right. They're also using it for people like the Tea Party and the Occupy groups, wow. any religious groups trying to get politically active, uh, uh, people like uh, uh, Petraeus and Allen who weren't following the political line of the government, or uh, Elliot Spitzer who was after the bankers, mm -hmm. you can't have that in this society, you have right. to get rid of them. Uh, but, uh, so most of the people with top security clearance work for private companies. Uh, uh, probably about half of them, I would think. So my like neighbor them. could work for, uh, you know, yeah. at the XYZ Corporation. That's right. Sure. Could know, uh, you know, my well, divorce man. record. My right. uh, about yeah. how many how many uh, uh, security uh, people employed in the United States? It's a round number. Just uh, give me a. Federal, in these 16 agencies, uh, well, uh, total. NSA's, NSA's the largest, with government employees, not counting contractors, that's probably about 40,000. Okay. With contractors, it's probably triple that. 
uh, uh, CIA is less, I don't know, uh, maybe maybe oh. 20,000 or something like that. And you, well, are they spying on each other or what? What yeah. the? Yeah. What yeah. They, they, do? they are, of course they are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> NSA spies on everybody they can, including House and Representatives and Senators and everybody else. They take in all the data on everybody. Oh, well, the one thing I, I wanted to mention is that the, President uh, Obama just recently, maybe it's up to a year, signed an executive order. I was trying to remember, maybe some of you, is it 14627? It's an executive order. It's called the Insider Threat Program. You talked about the Stasi in Germany. And basically, we now have a Stasi operating inside the federal government. Look up Insider Threat Program when you go home, Google it. What the Insider Threat Program does in the United States, and also I have an article in Black Agenda Report, so which will sort of summarize this for you. It basically says to every federal employee, you are responsible for making sure that we know of any insider threat. So for example, if your colleague, if you go out to lunch with a colleague and they tell you that their husband, or they're having financial problems, because that's a vulnerability, which means that they could be perhaps vulnerable to whatever, yeah. you have to go to the Insider Threat Office, which is now located in every single federal agency, and report that your colleague is having marital problems. Or it could be almost in you you're having problems with your kids, or it could be that you're, you know, you're overdrafted on your credit card, whatever it is. But they have essentially deputized every federal employee now to spy on each other. It's called the Insider Threat Program, and it was signed by the president. And I think that this is a major, a major issue that the, that the progressive left needs to really focus on, because this is, in fact, the Stasi. And when you look at the language, it was almost taken directly from the German to the English in, this, in, in the... So was NDA, uh, t Section 1021 of the NDAA, talking about the, the president can declare somebody a terrorist threat, right. have the military take them off the street, incarcerate them indefinitely with no due process. Uh, that's Executive Order 48 from the Nazis in 1933 after the Reichstag fire. It says exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. That's how they got rid of their enemies. And I was on the stage with uh, one of the former senior executives in the Stasi over in Germany when I was there. We were on a panel together, and he was talking about what the Stasi was doing. I was talking about what the NSA and the FBI were doing. We were saying exactly the same thing. In fact, uh, in, in last year, right after the Snowden material started coming out, uh, uh, Wolfgang Schmidt, a former lieutenant uh, colonel in the East German Stasi, was commenting on the NSA spying program. And he was saying, well, for us, meaning the Stasi, this would have been a dream come true. Mm. So, I mean, they're telling you exactly what kind of procedures our government is adopting. It's the totalitarian state we are. And it's by the way, state. if you know anyone who says to you, what do I have to worry about? I'm not doing anything wrong. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You get that Remember lot. this, Hitler's propaganda minister, Goebbels, said that very thing to the German people. If you're not doing anything wrong, you have nothing to, to worry about. about. Also, I would say that uh, uh, the, the Nazi state, one of the things that Hitler said was, uh, if you're going to tell a lie, make it a big one and tell it often until it's believed. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what our government's been doing with our spying. They've been lying to everybody continuously, and they continue to lie. They aren't coming out with the truth. They're afraid to. They can't, they, they, they're, they're so cowardly, they can't address the real issue that they're after, and that's to get rid of the first, fourth, and fifth amendments, and maybe the sixth, of our Constitution, at a minimum. There was Why a don't line. they say they want to get rid of it? Why don't they come out and just openly say it to us, then put a mo motion in Congress to get it, do the process, which is get it passed in Congress and circulate it for the states to ratify. That's how you change our Constitution. Right. You don't do it by secret interpretations and secret courts, in secret. That's, that's the real. It's why surveillance and this secrecy regime poses a threat to those who would organize. That's right. And this is one of the great fears that I have um, because this type of power does fear people organizing. Mm -hmm. This type of power fears, they can attempt to deal as they have with individual truth tellers, individual whistleblowers. There's a whole litany of truth tellers and whistleblowers who were charged, just like I was, uh, under the Espionage Act. 
Um, John Kiriakou is in prison right now. Um, he pled out. Um, he was also charged espionage, although he was, they ultimately dropped that charge. Um, he's in prison because <coughs> he actually was the first uh, government employee, former current, to acknowledge that torture was a state-sponsored program, and that it was worldwide. Um, so you, they can isolate individuals. They can they can bankrupt. Uh, people like they did with me, uh, make you persona non grata, basically radioactive. Um, uh, and yet, it's really organizing mm -hmm. as people that is actually <coughs> the bigger threat. I'm, I'm glad <coughs> you mentioned that, Thomas, because we have well, a, a member of the audience yeah. who can speak to that personally, Eddie Conaway, um, who was in prison for 44 <coughs> years. Eddie, do you, do you uh, mind standing up for us and um, We'd love to get your thoughts on what you've heard these panelists say. Well, you know, uh, one of the uh, things that hit me was the, uh, the hypocrisy of the Constitution itself. I mean, built on the back of slavery, uh, recognizing people. You wonder why black people, poor people, oppressed people aren't participating in this kind of stuff is because they have suffered and they have experienced the oppression the whole entire four or 500 years. They know this is wrong. The things that's being discovered now by the panel, uh, the government don't play fair, the government will abuse you, the government will oppress you. Well, the American <coughs> Indians know that. Mm -hmm. The Japanese know that. African Americans Amen. know People it. of color know so that. Yeah. And consequently, poor white people know that. And they have moved beyond that because they say, well, okay, everybody's lying in Congress. Everybody is lying in the media. They look at the media, they look at Fox, they look at the major networks, and they don't see themselves being represented. They don't hear about their issues. They don't hear about what's affecting them down in the community. They don't hear how to dope got into the community. They don't hear about the Golden Triangle in Vietnam. They don't hear about the Contras and the Iran-Contra affair and the drugs that came in to support the Nicaragua uh, 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 rebels. Uh, and that the government sponsored. They don't hear that 80 some or 85 percent of the news media is controlled by six multinational corporations. I agree with her. We have an economic problem here. It's the arrangement. That arrangement, that economic arrangement has allowed power to be concentrated in that 1% yeah. that he's talking about, and they control the government. Going to the Supreme Court, not gonna happen. It's right wing, they already brought, they're in there, Roberts is gonna, kill it mm -hmm. and we know it you can go to all the commissions you can go to the the, the senate uh, myself my personal thing i actually seen the church committee go through the whole cointel mm -hmm. pro thing and produce a hundred thousand files and then that's when i realized wow we've been played we've been abused yeah. and now we're being imprisoned and the government said, it's wrong. We shouldn't have did it. We broke the law. It's extrajudicial. Mm -hmm. We killed people. We set people up. We fomented violence. We acted out of order. Yet, the Black Panther Party members, the SDS members, the anti-war members, the, the, uh, the environmental people, the people that protested against the war, the people that protested against the conditions, they remained in jail. Set us up, recognized it was wrong, and still left us in jail. So we need, we need from the grassroots another social economic arrangement. And until we start talking about that, we're not gonna solve this problem because the mechanisms in place right now is to keep us distracted. We weren't about some football player's jersey. 
when stuff is really happening in our neighborhoods. That's detrimental. So we have to start talking, and that's why I like the real news, and that's why I hope that the real news become a major news network and vehicle in this region, because we need to be talking about the truth. We need to say this because we need to reach all segments of the population, but we need to look at what's going on down on the ground. How long were you in prison? <coughs> 44 years. And they knew after 12 years that they were wrong and kept me another 32 years. Were you in the Tight Black Panther Party? Yes. You were in the, okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, we actually have a Reality Asserts Itself series with Eddie. Um, you should all check it out online. And he tells his life story, and you can get all that backstory as well. So that's on therealnews.com. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. So I think this is kind of the point in our conversation where we can turn the corner a bit. And, and we talked about organizing as a solution. Um, but I think it's hard for, I'll speak for folks in my generation, to, 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 to understand what that actually looks like. Um, we're, we're so caught up in the world of the Kardashians and you know, all these distractions. You're talking about you know, t football. And you know, people, people are, are, are completely apathetic when it comes to politics. And, and it didn't help with President Obama. Um, you kind of got politicized for a little bit. And then you saw what transpired. And now you're even more apathetic. So. It, th this is kind of a question for my generation is, is, is what do we want that future to look like and how do we become active and, and, and eventually change that system? Um, so we're hoping to be a part of that and, and you can watch the revolution happen. Uh, it will be broadcast on the real news, <laughs> <laughs> say that. Um, okay, so I, I don't know how we're doing on time. I, don't, I didn't get a signal for anybody. How, how are we looking? Okay, so I think it's time we're gonna wrap up, but I wanna thank my panelists and, and, and all their comments, and I appreciate my audience, the, the questions. Thank you all so very much. And for those that are watching um, at home or in your office or whatever, please stay tuned. We're gonna be continuing series like this. We're gonna have screenings and panels. And right now we're in the middle of our fundraising campaign. Um, it's it's $100,000 campaign 100k challenge we call it for every dollar you give there is a matching grant so please do give please help us continue to make real news and we can only do it if it's sponsored by viewers like you all right thank you so much for joining us on the real news <laughs>